All right, my eager capitalists, who remembers my review of Brass? Is that the one where you fell in a canal? I think of it as the one where I took on that illustrious 2007 strategy game like a matador. The script darting this way and that before I nobly prodded at it with my spear of criticism. I think most people think of it as the one where you fell in the canal. Ten years on from its original release, I found Brass to be quite demanding and slow compared to more modern games vying for your shelf space. And then you dropped cake on the board? Oh yeah, that was great. Well, last year Canadian publisher Roxley Games kickstarted some new editions of Brass. There's Brass Lancashire, which is a beautiful new edition of the original game, but today we're looking at their other project, this. Brass Birmingham. The sequel to Brass, effectively. This is a collaboration between original designer Martin Wallace and Roxley Games, and this review in itself is a bit of a sequel. If you'd like to know more about the specifics of how Brass plays, we're going to politely ask you to go and watch Quinn's original review. You'll find a link to that in the description, because today we're going to be talking about what makes this different. And is it better? Do we like it more or less than original Brass? But straight out of the box, the art in this game is sensational. Yes, while the original Brass looked like the unfinished walls of someone's guest bedroom, Brass Birmingham brings the Industrial Revolution to life. Glimpses of green and blue disappearing under wrought iron and satanic mills. And if you flip the boards, you can swap day for night. This doesn't change the game, it's just sheer luxury. And honestly, this is my favourite kind of luxury. It's not a lavish or expensive box, but it's a production that just emanates warmth. The process of unpacking it just makes you feel fuzzy inside. It's like a box of chocolates that no one else currently knows exists. Ooh. Aesthetically, this is a labour of love, a cosy box that hurls you back in time to an era of brutal coldness, a time of sweat and coal. A period of history in which if your fireplace was dirty, you'd have to go and find a man who owned a child who would then send that child up the chimney with a brush to clean it. Thankfully though, the world today is extremely different and it's all been streamlined with an app. Ah, oh, how good is Boyfetch? Honestly, it's just so cheap. I can't quite even work out how these children make a living. Shall I get us a boy to uh, pack the game away when we're done with the review? Quinns, I've been hearing the word self-care a lot recently, which means I think this is fine. Okay. Um, Oliver huh? will be here in eight minutes. We have to do this review in eight minutes? So, underneath the art, not much has changed, and the things that have changed make the game more obtuse than the original Brass, and if you're familiar with the original Brass, that should set off some serious alarm bells. Ugh. You're still going around digging canals or making railways, you're still hungrily hoovering up the little blocks of coal and the blocks of iron from the player-made coal mines and iron mine factories that you've made before. But now rather than just shipping cotton, you're shipping cotton and pottery and the disappointingly generically named manufactured goods. There's boxes. You're just shipping boxes. Don't ask what's in the boxes. We're all going to make a lot of money. But more than that, you've also got a brand new resource. Beer. Now beer is beautiful and complicated in the fact that it doesn't work like coal or iron. Coal has to be attached to the network in order to be used. Iron doesn't have to be attached to the network at all and can be brought from anywhere at any point. Because iron can be carried in small amounts by horses and horses just traditionally aren't interested in networking at all. It's why whenever you go to events and see horses there, they never carry any business cards. But no, beer is an unholy hybrid. If you want to use someone else's beer, then it has to be connected to the network. But if you want to use your own beer, it can be anywhere. It can be connected just to your bit of the network or off on its own in the hills, which is exciting, but it is just another fiddly rule in a game that arguably didn't need any more fiddle. 
The other changes are less exciting. Obviously, the map of towns and connections is different, and rather than just shipping all your cotton west, Brass Birmingham actually scrambles the places where you send goods. So in our game, we're sending cotton south and pottery north, and the all-important hub connection that accepts everything is to the east, which means in our game, it's Belper's time to shine. Shine on you crazy Belper. Another difference is if you choose to spend your turn discarding cards so that you can build anywhere, you get two wild cards, which is slightly more generous. So Quinns, as the person who reviewed but ultimately didn't recommend the original brass, what do you think of Birmingham? Matt, can I get a drum roll? Yes. I recommend Brass Birmingham with every fibre of my being. I think this is my favourite management game since Great Western Trail? I think this is one of my new favourite games. Ever? It, ever. It's, it's up there in the list. It is so good. It is so good. Ah, great game design isn't always 100% neat and clean and tidy, and Birmingham arguably, in lots of ways, is slightly messy. There's lots of strange amendments, lots of tiny tweaks to things here and there. Superficially, everything originally just looks fine, but then you have a look underneath the bonnet and you can tell it's had some interesting work done. But to go through all of these vital changes with a toothpick would be as tedious as going through patch notes for an online RPG that doesn't exist. I'll give you the top line here. Brass was a game which was complicated and unforgiving, whereas Brass Birmingham is a game that's just complicated. In Quinn's original review of Brass, he talked about how at some points in the game it felt like your options became a tight corset with you looking around the board for things you could do, checking the rules. No, 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 no. Until the one thing you can do on your next turn, you think, yes, yes, I've got a thing I can do. Your friend does it before you could. In this version of the game in Brass Birmingham, all of these tiny changes create a version of the game that suits other people better. People like me, who maybe are not as good at the super turbo complex cruel games. Both games feel so similar. Both games give you a hand of eight cards to choose from every time. But for players like me, Brass Birmingham is the only game that regularly gives me meaningful choices. This makes the game easier and harder, but it's the right kind of easy and the right kind of hard. There's less searching the board for the one thing you can do where frustration turns into desperation. There's more cherry picking of, oh, I might do that and then that. I might do this or that. More choices that feel exciting. And crucially, the spikes of emotion that come up in games of brass are when someone else has taken something that you wanted. But in these cases, it's often because they've been canny, and savvy. They've gone, I'm going to take that because I know that someone else wants it, rather than just being a toddler that stumbles onto their sandcastle because they were confused and didn't know where else to go. Along the same lines, randomising where you ship goods every game means that Brass Birmingham is much more of a game about reacting to something that's fluid. Some games, the game will dart south, and Birmingham, the great spidery hub, will be where all the action is. And in other games, you'll have to go further north, which is northern for north, and pay through the nose, linking up all these tiny towns. And this is great, because we always say on Shut Up and Sit Down that it's awesome when games are different every time you play, because it means you're that much more likely to take that game off the shelf and get your money's worth. Similarly, it's lovely in Brass Birmingham that you can specialise. Because buildings get better every time you build one, you are rewarded for choosing one particular thing that you're really going to do this game. Like in one game you might choose to be Billy Beer, who dictates the flow of the game with beer lubricating the entire network. In another game you might be the fastidious Mrs. Manufactory, building boxes that are different every time. Or, my personal favourite, you can be Peter Pottery, a high-risk, high-reward play because potteries are unbelievably expensive. And also, half of them are bad. But if you can get them on the limited spaces on the board where they uh, go, then flip them, you get incredible rewards. And actually, that kind of sums up Birmingham because that same mechanic was in Brass, but it's so much more present here. 
The freedom you have means that you have the opportunity to specialize far more. With just tweaking, this mechanic opens up like a flower growing beside a canal. Flowers. And let's be honest, this art doesn't hurt the experience. No, it's gorgeous. And you know, I've got to say, we always love it when board games do make an effort to be a little bit more diverse, which is why I was thrilled to discover that when I just flip this player token, you can be a man or you can be a man with a hat. I do think some of these have women on. Um, Which ones? This one? If we flip the red one. That one? Is uh, this one? Purple? No, you flipped that one already. Okay. Um, um, did, you, did you flip this one? No. Oh, here they are. Oh, hello. To be fair, though, I think they did actually make a decent effort to include every prominent female industrialist of the era in the game. Just, there weren't many of them. Maybe it's just that men are more naturally inclined to sending children up chimneys, etc. Are we the bad guys? Yes. Okay. So much of great game design resides in the details. And we're not just talking about rules here either. When you're dealing with a communal shared space of things that you touch and hold and move around, aesthetics and how things feel are incredibly important. They're like a hotline to your soul. And Brass Birmingham for me might be a modern masterclass of things and bits. The board is wonderfully claustrophobic and dense, allowing for industry to explode like a virus. Your player boards are a pain in the bum to set up, but these tiny treats feel like a sweet shop window of possibility. But the best thing? Look at how readable the game state is because of the choice of components. Different materials creating tiers of prominence that allow you to see the important stuff first. Beer, then coal and iron, then the buildings and networks on the board. In an era in which a lot of people want games to be all plastic or all wood, this is a textbook example of why texture is good. I think we can summarize this really simply. Uh, when Matt and I finished a game of original Brass, now Brass Lancashire, we just feel a bit exhausted. Mm. Whereas with Brass Birmingham, every time I finish a game of this, I just want to play it again immediately, which is why Brass Birmingham gets the Shut Up and Sit Down recommends badge Absolutely. unequivocally yeah. easy. If this was just brass, but with less friction and better art, that would be great, that would be enough. But it's got all this other stuff, it's deeper, it's more thematic. Beer is unusual and fascinating and funny. You build it off miles away from everything else, which is just the complete opposite of how brass usually works. And more than that, you'll build it, you'll have your beer, and then you specifically won't drink your beer. You'll drink other people's beer first, just because it's annoying. And they'll look at you with horror. And that's, and that's why I play games. <laughs> uh, you know what else, and this really surprised us, it is cheap, mm. right? I mean, your mileage may vary depending on where you live in the world, but broadly, According to the numbers that I could Google, Brass Birmingham is $30 cheaper than A Feast for Odin. It is $20 cheaper than Lowlands. It's even about $5 cheaper than uh, Great Western Trail. Mm. And look, mm. and it mm. comes in this tiny box. This is so important to me. This can just go anywhere. I love it. It is still a remarkably tricky game to teach and learn. And it is still a game which has a level of complexity, which means occasionally things will grind to a stop and there'll be some analytical uh, paralysis, but a nice quantity of it. It's a game which basically is still hard work, but is so much more readily rewarding of that work. It's yes. not a game that feels like it's draining you. It's a game where it pops into life and things chain off. It's exciting. It's electrifying. I mean, we it's played fun. we played original Brass. Well, you played it twice. I've played it twice, and I don't have any interest in playing it again. This I've played four, maybe five times in the last month, and I would play it again right now. I'd like to play it again right now. It's one of those games where filming the review, we have just been like, oh, I wish we weren't working. I wish we were playing yeah, this. And yeah. As soon as you start unboxing, is that the door? Hello, sirs. I'm here to tidy up your board game. Very. Late. One star? Oh, oh star please, sir. Uh, would you like a complimentary bottle of water? Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Maybe two stars. Uh, what if I did the YouTube outro? Yeah, all right. Maybe three, I know. Uh, if you've enjoyed this video, they have other videos that you can watch. All sorts of board game coverage. World's best. 
You please.